Not all warriors come from lavish or honorable upbringings. Not all are born into power or into greatness. But quite often, it is the one who has seen hardship firsthand, the ones that have been pitted against fate itself and come out on top, who are the most worthy to earn the name warrior. Destiny and fate are not kind, but like all enemies, a warrior must stand up to them, fight them, and in the end, bend them to their will. Such is the way of the Ephira, the warrior scholars from Arabia who have appeared in Heathmore with a passion for combat, a scholarly mind, and a mace to get their point across. With an acrobatic agility that rivals the Shinobi themselves, the Ephira have already started making waves in the lands of Heathmore, promising literal game-changing ideas for the future. But there is one more question that must be answered. Who are the Ephira? This is a question that's been asked since the season's announcement. Just who are these warriors? Are there really Arabic women warriors out there in the histories of the Middle East? What are the origins of this gymnast, scholar, and warrior? Well, let's talk about it. Welcome back to Heroes in History, the series where we take a look at all of For Honor's heroes and analyze who they are most likely based on, and today, it's time to talk about the Ephira. So before we begin, quick disclaimer. I debated whether or not I should even do this video because, even as early as my first impressions, I've been bombarded with critics and skeptics telling me who they thought the Ephira were and why I was wrong for even assuming otherwise. And some of those comments got a little insulting. I don't know, there's just something about the Ephira that has some people split in terms of her origins. Some people may not like her moveset all that much, some may not like her design, some may not like the fact that she's gender locked. Some may not like the fact that she's a goody two-shoes in the lore, and don't worry, you can expect a video on that too. And now, even her historical inspirations are somehow causing a split. So today, I'm not going to just talk about who I think she's based on. I also want to really break down the evidence for and against that I found for all the other possibilities. I've heard arguments that she's a Persian warrior, an Arabic fighter, an Ottoman genissary, and, of course, my own personal conclusion. So, who do I think the Ephira is? I believe that the Ephira is most likely based on the Mamluk warriors of the Middle East. Now, before I go into my reasons, let's first discuss who the Mamluks were, and in order to discuss that, we need to go back into Middle Eastern history and into the history of Islamic warfare. The word Mamluk translates to one who is owned, or in other words, a slave. The term was used to refer to non-ethnic Arab slaves that were taken from Turkish, Caucasian, Greek, Russian, Eastern and Southeastern European, and other various tribes around the Arabic world, and they were put into military administrative combat roles. From what we know, the practice of using Mamluk warriors in Islamic military forces began as far back as the 9th century during the Abbasid Caliphate of Baghdad. But the use of slave soldiers was a necessary choice and one that fit in line with the philosophy of, of the Islamic Caliphates for years. After all, why waste the lives of your own when you can use your own enemies against themselves? We can see this as far back as the Seljuk Turks, who were, at first, slave warriors themselves before rising up to become one of the main militant forces of the Islam of the age, and I may need to do a whole video about them, but that's for another time. According to Islamic historian Raymond Ibrahim, the Mamluks, quote, from earliest youth were purchased or captured, converted to Islam, and trained in a harsh and disciplinary environment for warfare. This would be a long-lasting tactic of the Islamic world all the way up to the Ottoman Empire and the Janissary Corps, but again, that's for another video, I think. Mamluks were, at first, seen as expendable, but their skill in combat was simply unquestionable. They excelled at warfare, and over time, they began to be seen more and more as military administrators rather than just mere labor workers given weapons and armor. It actually became a normal practice to educate Mamluks for public administration, and several high-ranking members of caliphate courts and office were run by Mamluks, including Badr al-Jamali of the Fatimid Caliphate, who was a well-renowned vizier and advisor. And of course, Rukun al-Din, known as the cornerstone of Islam, who also went by the name Baibars, who was an especially strong and ruthless Mamluk commander. By the end of the 9th century, Mamluks were a standard and crucial part of the military of the Islamic Empire. In fact, under the famous Sultan of Egypt, Salahaddin, 
the Mamluks grew even more important and powerful under the Ayyubids, as he had decided to replace the pre-existing black African infantry regiments with almost entirely Mamluk regiments in the 12th century. But, just because they were important warriors did not mean that they were treated any better than their station allowed. Though given weapons and status above most free men, they were still slaves to the sultans and the caliphs. And there were some sultans who made the fatal mistake of mistreating their now armed, empowered, and emboldened servants. In the year 1250 AD, the Sultan Al-Muazim Turan Shah had just completed his defeat of King Louis IX of France, who had failed in his Seventh Crusade and had him captured. However, Turan Shah was not liked or trusted by anyone. His father, who had died in the Seventh Crusade, had left him with the throne and many people didn't like him on it. He was cruel to his Mamluks and during his banquet celebrating his victory, he made jests and threats at his Mamluks, despite their role in the battle. In fact, one of the games he played was he ordered his Mamluks to bring him candles that were already lit. Then he would take his sword and slice the candles in half, claiming that these are like the heads of his Mamluk soldiers that will roll if they fail him. This went a little too far and a little too long. Led by Baibars, the Mamluks revolted and killed Turansha, ending the Ayyubid dynasty as he was the last Ayyubid Sultan. This led to the first Mamluk Sultan, or rather, Sultana of Egypt, Shajar al-Dur. Shajar al-Dur was a Mamluk and widowed wife and concubine to Asali Ayyub, the former Kurdish ruler of Egypt who died in the Seventh Crusade and the father of Turansha. And yes, that meant she was technically Turansha's stepmother. Now she was not Arabic, as I said before, she was a former concubine made into a wife and was a Mamluk herself. Historical accounts differ on her actual origins, be they Greek, Armenian, or Turkish, we're not sure. But what is known is that she was named the first Sultana of the new Mamluk dynasty in Egypt in the year 1250. But unfortunately for Shajar, she faced a new problem. Though Turansha was the last Ayyubid Sultan, there were still loyal Ayyubid emirs in Syria who did not approve of this new Mamluk uprising and definitely didn't approve of a woman sitting on the Sultan's throne. So after only three months on the throne, her fellow Mamluks, the ones who'd helped her rise to power in fact, encouraged her to marry one Iz al-Din Aybak and make him the Sultan. She agreed to the decision so that it would settle issues between them and the Ayyubid Caliphs but it still wasn't enough, it didn't please the Ayyubids one bit. Conflict broke out. Though the Mamluks had only recently taken power in Cairo, they still maintained military superiority. Remember, they were a warrior group. They were very good at waging war. And despite the Ayyubids having numbers and the Caliph on their side, they knew that the resulting battle with the Mamluks would prove to be disastrous. So, inevitably, a compromise was met. This solidified power for the new Mamluk Sultanate in Egypt, and from there the influence of the Mamluks began to grow until they had Syria as well, and then soon Palestine, and eventually the entire Middle East and the entire Islamic Empire now recognized the power of the Mamluks. Though the empire itself was mostly bound to Egypt and Syria, the reach of the Mamluks spread far wider as every Islamic kingdom of the time had been using Mamluks in their fighting force, going as far east as India and as far west as Spain. This new Mamluk dynasty forced many in power to reevaluate their appreciation for and treatment of Mamluks because they certainly didn't want to piss off the Mamluk sultans of Egypt. Although, they were still allowed to treat them as slaves, of course, that simply wasn't negotiable. Though they would always be seen as slave soldiers to the general public and to the Islamic world, the Mamluks had earned their place in the Islamic Empire. Slaves no more. They were rulers. And they would remain the dominant power of the Islamic Empire until 1517, when they were finally eclipsed by the powerful Ottoman Empire. But, that is a tale for another time. Now, I want to reiterate here, the Mamluks were exceptional warriors. They were trained, taught, and indoctrinated to do one thing, fight in the Jihad against the enemies of Islam. And they were exceptional at it. This practice was actually so effective that when the Ottoman Empire began expanding into the Balkan territories of Europe, they instituted a very similar slave soldier system to the Janissary Corps, in which Christian boys were stripped from their families, taken into servitude, indoctrinated, converted, and made into the official shock troopers of the Ottoman state. 
and one could argue that this was inspired by how effective the Mamluks were. Mamluks, being slaves, were expendable and replaceable, but being diverse in ethnicity and background meant that they had a wide assortment of body types, strengths, and capabilities that could be used to great effect in war. Plus, they might have intimate knowledge of the ways of war and cultures that they came from, which would greatly help in Islamicizing and spreading the faith of Islam to these people. They were also well-armed, well-trained and educated in diplomatic state affairs as well. They were actually so capable and so skilled, they even fought back the Mongol hordes to a standstill, a feat that is not a small one. Say what you will of their status as slaves, their martial abilities were simply unquestionable. So, now that we've undergone a history of the Mamluks and their rise to power, as well as the nature of their use and fighting capabilities, how can we say they're related to the Ephira? After all, we do see a major problem with the Afir that needs to be addressed. They are an all-women group, and Islam had a unique perspective on women, particularly in terms of warfare. In the Battle of Yarmouk, for example, during the first encounter between Byzantine forces and the Islamic Empire, there were women in the Muslim military camps, but they weren't there to fight. Their job was to use poles and staves to hit any fleeing or cowering Muslim fighters, as it was shameful to be struck by a woman in their culture. Women were not there to have a battlefield role. We won't go into the way women were treated during that time during the Islamic rule, but we can take a look at a specific quote from a hadith from Shar Asiyar al-Kabir 1184, quoted al-Sarkasi, who said, quote, We do not like women to fight alongside men in war because a woman does not have the right physical makeup for fighting, as the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, indicated when he said, this one was not a fighter, said when he saw the body of a woman slain on the battlefield. And when a woman fights, the aura of the Muslims may become exposed, and the Mushrikeen, who are infidels and non-Muslims, will rejoice at that. And they may be a cause of the Mushrikeens increasing their hopes of defeating the Muslims. And they may think that the Muslims are weak because they had to bring the women to fight. So they will say, they need the help of women to fight us. So this should be avoided. For this reason, it is not recommended for women to participate directly in the fighting. But if the Muslims have no choice and are forced to do that, because repelling the Kufar, non-Muslims, when necessary by whatever means the Muslims have at their disposal is permissible, rather it is obligatory. In other words, it was greatly disliked to see women on the battlefield, let alone having entire female warrior groups made up of them. So we can go ahead and acknowledge that this is not going to be a historically accurate representation of a Mameluk. But is there anything else outside of gender? Actually, there's quite a lot. Firstly, the Faran or Loran Afira states that they were taken off the streets as children from the most poor and outcast families. Now, if Arabia in Faran is as prosperous and well off as the lore claims, there can't be terribly many poor families, so perhaps that means outcasts are the next best thing, and seeing as conquered and enslaved families would be considered outcasts, maybe even demis, and that's a term, not a term we can go over another time, they would definitely be seen as outcasts, and this could be a rough tie into the slave warrior system. Now, I of course acknowledge that Ubisoft did not say this, and I highly doubt Ubisoft would ever actually use such a thing as their background for the warriors, but I feel it would make more sense, seeing as it's a lot easier to recruit from conquered peoples than your own poorest and destitute, especially when your city is so prosperous that it seems hard to think you'd ever find enough people to fill that quota. Secondly, the Afira act as guards of the Sultana, and they also were given strict education. Mamluks, likewise, as they grew in importance and station, began to receive similar education so that they might function effectively in higher stations. This would serve them well as they reached the position of Sultanate. Thirdly, and though it is packaged a little differently, I admit, having a female Sultana historically that founded the Mamluk Sultanate could tie into the Sultana of Honor being there, the one that was killed by Ravier. But even without the Sultana connection, with Ravir killing the Sultana, giving the Afira a direct opportunity to take power, or at the very least temporary control of Arabia, that does connect nicely to history and how the Mamluks rose to power with the ending of the Ayyubid dynasty. Granted, the Mamluks were the ones who killed the previous Ayyubid Sultan, and in this case it was Ravir who killed the Sultana, but hey, you know, it, just different ways of getting to the same end. Fourth, the default armor of the Afira does bear some similarities to certain Mamluk armors we have on record, and the mason shield was a combination not unfamiliar to the Mamluks. And finally, just to get even more meta, 
That infamous kick that Afira does after an opening attack, the For Honor uh, team calls it a Kasaki kick. This is a reference to Yalbuga Al-Kasaki, a senior Mamluk emir in the 14th century. In fact, in the game Medieval 2 Total War, the term given to the Sultan's elite troops are the Kasaki, which are an obvious reference to the Mamluks. And now, of course, and as promised, I will take this time to address some of the criticisms and skeptic claims that I've received from others here, predominantly the ones arguing that the Afira is actually Persian in origin. I'm well aware that there are plenty of people out there who believe that there is lots of Persian influence on Afira. And while I can agree that some aspects of her attire do appear Persian, such as her trousers, which do appear Persian in origin, I simply can't agree to much else. What we'll do is I'd like to analyze a specific comment I received that gave the most detailed evidence for her being a Persian. The commenter starts by saying the following, quote, Clearly a light and agile Persian Takabara, since the 5th century, the only people in the Middle East to adapt the Greek Peltas shield. So let's start with that. The Takabara was a Persian light infantry unit that existed during the Achaemenid Empire of Persia, which lasted from 550 BC to the time Alexander the Great conquered Persia in 330 BC. This was almost a full 300 years before Christianity, let alone Islam. And since the developers made it clear that the Afira was inspired by Islamic warriors in history, and the Takabara disappeared well before Islam was a thing, this creates a problem. Also, not to be pedantic, but 330 BC is a good 700 years before the 5th century, as was said in the comment. Now, it is true that they did carry a similar shield to the Greek Peltast, which they call the Taka, hence the name, and Greeks who saw them assumed that these warriors were a type of Peltast trained soldier. And I will also concede that the shield that the Ephira carry does have the same crescent shape that the Peltast seems to have. However, the shield of the Takabara was a wicker one in nature and rather weak, whereas the shield of the Afera is solid and made of iron at least. In fact, I might argue that because some Mamluks were Greek in origin, is it not also possible that this shield could be a nod to their Greek origins? I know that's just as much of a stretch, but it's still plausible. But, more importantly, the Takabar were considered largely ineffective against heavier infantry or soldiers, as was made clear during the Battle of Thermopylae. This is why they became relegated to garrison warriors rather than frontline warriors. Though they were light on their feet and agile like the Afira, they were almost useless against most well-armored hoplites in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And since hand-to-hand -hand combat is something that the Afira excels in, this could prove to be a problem. The commenter goes on to say, Wielding a mace, one of the most prolific Indo-Persian weapons of all, called Shishpar. Um, firstly, the mace is hardly the most prolific Indo-Persian weapon. Just a simple Google search of Indo-Persian weapons yields mostly scimitars, axes, and other weapons outside of Shishpars. Secondly, the Shishpar was introduced into Persia around the Delhi dynasty, which was started, in large part, thanks to Mamluk influence. So it stands to reason the mace might have also been influenced by the Mamluks as well. I'm not sure, but to argue that just because she wields a mace that must obviously make her Persian is silly when various other cultures throughout the world were using maces and clubs in combat. The next part says this, wearing Persian trousers and a Kula Kud, the Persian helmet. Now I will admit that the trousers are most likely a nod to Persian culture, but the Kula Kud? Actually, the default helmet appears to be a Chichak helmet, which is a Turkish or Syrian helmet style, which fits for the Mamluks since many were Turkish or Syrian in origin. And finally, the commenter ends with a joke by saying, it's a Turkish Janissary from the 15th to 18th century. Clown face, clown face, clown face, clown face. I'm going to eat some broken glass with salt and pepper. Now, interestingly enough, this comment was in response to my first impressions video, in which I was making early assessments, and in which I argued for both the Janissary and the Mamluk. And as I said in the video, it was just a first impressions video, so I have yet to do in-depth research or analysis as of yet. But, now that I have done that research and analysis, I have this to say. I hope that this person did not actually eat broken glass with salt and pepper, as any connoisseur such as myself knows that broken glass would taste terrible with pepper. <laughs> Jokes aside, I don't mean to dismiss the theories of Persian influence on the character. In truth, there are a few nods to Persian influence. Some of the designs and details on the armors look like they reference Persian art. The trousers, like I said, are likely a nod to Persian clothing. 
and the theme music of the season is a Persian poem sung in the same language. So there is certainly Persian influence involved, I grant that. But I don't think that's because what, that's what the character's based on. Really, I blame it more on the fact that Ubisoft is a fan of what sells, not what is accurate. Otherwise, this hero would not be all female, and they likely would be wielding a scimitar instead of a mace. The Ubisoft developers admitted in their live stream that they picked and mixed different aspects of the Islamic world throughout history to create this character, which I both can understand, but I'm also disappointed about. On the one hand, I can't blame them for picking and choosing the best qualities of Muslim warriors of the time period. Doing so serves to create a very cool hero in terms of design. But on the other hand, the historian in me cringes slightly at what is what we have here is a warrior who could not have existed in history. In fact, if an Afira in history actually existed, like a female warrior group like this during the time of the Islamic Empire in its heyday, it would have been seen as somewhat insulting and even a little blasphemous. Now, of course, I'm not overlooking the existence of Peacekeeper or Nusya. I'm aware that other warriors in the game are just as historically odd for being female, but the reason I mention this so vehemently is the principle of the thing. While we looked at a hadith earlier that explained why Islamic empires, nations, didn't want to have women fighters, there are no such laws or writing in the early Christian texts about women fighting. In fact, quite the opposite. There are sources claiming that during the defense of Belgrade in 1456, there were women seen fighting among the Crusaders to hold back the Ottoman forces. And in 1149, there was the Order of the Hatchet, founded to honor the brave women who fought against the Muslim invasion of Tortosa in Spain during the Reconquista. But there are no named warrior women in groups in Islamic texts or history. The few occasions that we do hear about warrior women are usually from literature or they are so rare that it seems to be an exception rather than a rule. But with all that said, that certainly doesn't mean I dislike the Afira, nor am I saying that what they're based on should impact whether or not you play them. I have studied the crusading era, the Islamic expansion, and the conflict between the Christian West and the Muslim East for years now. It's actually become a bit of a passion of mine to study and further understand this era. And because of that, this hero fascinates me. There's a lot I see in her that makes me excited for her. I love playing with her in spite of it all. There's something very exotic about the Afira. Despite their name meaning gazelle, I actually think of her more as a snake or a serpent. Her ability to maneuver around her opponents, use grapple-like techniques to take down her foe, and then striking in forceful and direct ways while then slithering out of reach, reminds me very much of a viper or a serpent. But, you know, that fits as far as I'm concerned. Snakes are dangerous animals, but also very beautiful. They can make wonderful pets if cared for correctly and treated with love, respect, and devotion. I mean, you can't really go wrong, but beware because a snake is still a predator, and even the most gorgeous viper can deliver venom to those who aggravate it. Just as the sultans of old were not careful with the vipers they had thought enslaved and subjugated, so too has Horcos failed to respect the nest of serpents that now have made their way into Heathmore. And like the Mamluks for whom they are inspired, their martial skills and power cannot be questioned. Thank you for watching this Heroes in History. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you in my next one. Take care. The battle will be <laughs> Stop right there! Fight! Oh no! Ooh, that's kind of small. You want to see me do it again? You captured Zone C. You captured Zone I see. So that's how it is, huh?
That's how it's gonna be, is it? That's the way in which things are, eh? Later. Victory!